Welcome to the Reading and Understanding Your Air Permit Module. This module is presented by the Division of Compliance Assistance Environmental Compliance Assistance Program. The Division of Compliance Assistance is part of the Kentucky Department for Environmental Protection. DCA exists to provide services that increase environmental knowledge and encourage positive behavioral changes. DCA does this to improve regulatory compliance, achieve exceptional performance, and to enhance the quality of Kentucky's environment and communities. When you receive an air permit, be sure you read through the entire document and become familiar with and understand your facility's emission units and compliance demonstration methods. I'm going to go through the permit layout with screenshot examples of permit sections from several sources. I will not go into depth about each of the actual conditions, but rather I will present examples so you may see where and what you are looking at in the different sections of your permit. Let's begin with the cover page. It has some very important information such as the permittee and source name and mailing addresses. The mailing address may be the same as the source location. The source location is where the facility actually resides. It is not a PO box, but rather a physical address. The permit ID, which will start with a G, S, F, or V for the different types of permits. The agency interest number, which is a very important identifier when dealing with the Kentucky Department for Environmental Protection. It is a good number to memorize or at least have handy. The review type is the type of source you are, whether minor, conditional major, Title V, etc. The source ID is a 10-digit number that starts with 21. Your regional office and contact information are always printed on the cover page. Also, the permit issuance date and expiration date are listed on your cover page. As a note, all facilities must submit a permit renewal six months prior to the expiration date. Make sure to mark this on your calendars. Many permits are laid out in the same manner. However, due to the variability of sources and operations, the layout may vary, but all permits have the same general sections. Section A is the permit authorization. Section B is where regulations and requirements for each of the emission points or mission units are laid out. Your permit may have groups or individual units, depend upon the processes and operations at the facility. Although all sections of your permit are important, pay very in close attention to Section B. I will soon break down the components of this section down. Section C are the insignificant activities which your facility may or may not have. Section D are the facility-wide emission limits and potential testing requirements. For facilities that have source-wide limits, this is the section that specifies those limits or conditions and how to comply. Section E lists out any special control provisions. Section F covers the monitoring, record keeping, and reporting provisions. G includes general provisions. H, alternate operating scenarios. I will list a compliance schedule. H and I may or may not exist on your permit. This is what Section A will look like and will vary depending upon the type of source you are. For example, this Section A was taken from a conditional major permit. Section B labels each emission point or emission unit, provides a description, and will indicate rated capacities and control equipment and efficiencies. If you have several emission points that are similar, they may have group requirements instead of listed for each point. For all emission points, the applicable regulations are referenced. Applicable regulations are the basis for your air permit and will determine monitoring, record keeping, and reporting. The section B for each emission point is broken down into seven sections listed here. The way these are referenced may vary between facilities due to the differences among operations and sources. For example, number one, the operating limitations. These are three examples. One, which provides an actual limitation, the filters are to be in place. Another, without operating limitations. And the other references 
another section or limitation. Section 2. Emission limitation is where you will find what the limitation is and how you are to prove that the limitation is being maintained. For example, a common limitation is an opacity limit or visual emissions limitation. The method of compliance for this unit is weekly observations and maintaining a log. Please note, if you are required to monitor it, then you should record it and it will need to be reported. Another common emission limit is for particulate matter. In this case, the filter system is to be in place in order to be in compliance with the emission limit. Hazardous air pollutant and VOC limitations usually require a 12-month rolling total to be kept. Your permit does explain how to calculate the rolling total. Usually, this resides in Section D. If you are unsure of how to perform the required 12-month rolling total emission calculations, please contact the Division of Compliance Assistance for assistance or training. DCA can assist small businesses with creating easy, user-friendly rolling total spreadsheets. Another type of a true emission limit is when a limit is imposed for a particular pollutant. This occurs often when air toxic assessment indicates that the particular level of a defined pollutant is determined to be hazardous to human health or the environment when it is above a certain level. This is an example from another conditional major permit that is required to perform rolling totals of their HAP and VOC emissions, except the air toxics assessment indicates that the facility cannot emit more than two tons per year of ethyl benzene. Testing requirements. Again, varies depend upon the operation. Some require frequent testing and others require testing upon request by the cabinet. The monitoring requirements are written into your permit and required so the facility remains aware of the state of the emission unit and observe the operations for any changes that may occur over time. Monitoring requirements ensure that emissions from a mission unit are supervised, tested, sampled, or otherwise observed on a regular and ongoing basis. Types of monitoring include product usage, visual limitations, etc. This section may fully describe the requirement or reference a different section of the permit that already has listed these requirements, like we saw the opacity limit listed in section B2. Record keeping requirements. Again, some permits will list or potentially relist all of their required records or will reference another portion of the permit that has already indicated the record keeping requirement. Records can be kept in paper or in electronic format. For example, this permit requires opacity logs, paint booth logs, material usage logs, rolling total emission calculations, and apparently looking at E, the facility also has lower limits on naphthalene and cobalt emissions due to their air toxics assessment. The same theory applies with reporting requirements. Again, remember if you are required to monitor it, then record it and report it. Section seven, the control equipment requirements and also keep records of any maintenance. For example, when you change out your filters. Section C, list the insignificant activities. Insignificant does not mean that they can be forgotten about you may still have requirements to report them in your EIS and list them on your semi-annual and annual reports. Just because these are listed as insignificant does not mean ignore them. As you can read in this text, the permittee must comply with the regulations and process and emission controls subject to the opacity standard shall be inspected monthly and qualitative visible emissions made and record them in a log. Also, those that have to keep a 12-month rolling total, such as a facility with the VOC and HAPS, we need to include the solvents used for the cleaning gun listed in this insignificant activity. 
Section D contains explanations on how to calculate the 12-month rolling totals or particulate matter emission limitations. This may also be called general conditions section of the permit. Section E, control equipment requirements, different types of control equipment, including scrubbers, afterburners, thermal oxidizers, etc. Be sure to check this section for monitoring, record keeping, and reporting requirements. Section F, this tells what the facility needs to record if and when testing is required. Please note, all records must be kept on site for five years. You are required to let inspectors in the facility and not obstruct, hamper, or interfere with them. They are just doing their job. If you'd like to know a bit more about what to expect from an inspection and how you can be prepared, you can visit the Kentucky Department for Environmental Protection's Naturally Connected blog for a December 4th post entitled, What to Inspect from a DEP Inspection. Here is the semi-annual monitoring report requirements. These are submitted every six months and are due postmarked by January 30th and July 30th. 7 and 8 for startup, shutdown, malfunctions, and emission exceedance notification requirements. For notifications, you may contact your regional office inspector or preferably submit routine notifications electronically on the depgateway.ky.gov portal. A routine notification includes release of pollutants or contaminants that do not cause an imminent danger to human health or the environment. The release is below the reportable quantity of the contaminant and the release does not cause a sheen on the waters of the Commonwealth. Notifications are only required if a planned startup or shutdown emissions expect to exceed the standard. For unplanned startup shutdown malfunctions, a facility must notify when emissions are or may be in excess of the standards. Do not submit a notification every time there is a startup, shutdown, or malfunction if there are no excess emissions and no reason to expect any. Section 9 is for the Annual Compliance Certification. This goes through everything that is required on the ACC. Section G, with the general provisions, is full of information. One item, as I mentioned earlier, is that six months prior to the expiration date of your permit, a renewal must be submitted. H&I, like I said before, your permit may or may not have information listed here if your facility operations are not subject to either. If you have specific questions regarding your permit requirements, please contact your regional office. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact the Division of Compliance Assistance at 800-926-8111, email us at envhelp at ky.gov, or visit us online at dca.ky.gov. Thank you for joining us, and this concludes the Understanding Your Air Permit module.